Hello, and welcome to Radio Free Acton, the podcast of the Acton Institute dedicated to the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts. And on this episode, you'll first hear from award-winning news anchor Anne Marie Schieber as she speaks with James Morgan about his job at Kirkster Precast, an industrial plant, getting a look into what the job looks like every day and how he finds enjoyment and motivation in what he does. Then, after that, I speak with Fela McAleer, co-producer of the new film Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. Since its release, the film has succeeded with audiences, but continues to face harsh backlash and media blackout. If you're interested in learning more about today's segments, check out our show notes, published every Wednesday at blog.acton.org. I'm standing at a commercial construction work site where an 850,000 square foot warehouse is being built. That's about the size of nine big box retailers. It's huge. My company produces the structural wall panels that you see on site today here. Today, big warehouses like this don't get poured on site with concrete. Instead, they're assembled with prefabricated concrete structures made at industrial complexes like the one where James Morgan works. It's amazing to be one little guy that just moves some things around and it affects hundreds of guys down the road. And to know that there's 200 guys back at a plant that are making a job site roll is, is awesome. It's just, it's very humbling. And it's engaging. It's Legos, pretty much, for grown-ups is what it is. The company where Morgan works, Kirkster Precast, sits on a huge lot off one of Michigan's interstate highways. And if you're driving, you get the sense you've passed a mini city. I arrive before sunrise and get the sense I'm late for work. You have a very early morning, but people come in even earlier than right. you. And it's 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. And this place is bustling. Yes. Morgan oversees about 70 people, the company's materials group. So my groups are welders, carpenters, rebar fabricators, material handlers, and we fabricate and deliver all the material to our production plant needed for the next day of production. Because these structures take up so much space, there is no room for mistake. A concrete panel can't just sit there until it's right. It has to be formed, poured, and moved out in one day so the plant can create the next one. Some jobs could have 60 panels, some could have 300. See back over there is our detailing area. So every wall panel or beam or double T, anything that comes out of the building, will go over there and our detailing group will go through and touch it up. The structures have to be perfect because sending them back is a big deal. It has to be a 24 hour operation to meet demand and be profitable. My department feeds all the plant, so there's a bunch of other teams that they feed. They, they provide stuff to the yard, so if we're not executing our goals of supplying our material 100% correct and on time, then we're affecting the next guy. The workday really starts at 4 a.m. and lasts 10 hours, starting first with the construction of the molds. At the beginning of the line, a team feeds what is called rebar, metal pipe really, into a machine that bends it according to a computer design, kind of like 3D printing. The molded metal is then assembled to make a frame. It takes hours to do this, and on this day, it didn't help when there was a computer glitch. Instead of being frustrated, Morgan is fired up. Every day is a new day here. It doesn't matter if we're doing the same exact thing, there's gonna be something different that comes at you. The clock is ticking because eventually the concrete needs to be poured, given time to dry, sometimes cut, and then lifted out of the plant by huge overhead cranes to be brought outside for final detail work before delivery. Make nothing of the long days, the early hours, the noise in the plant. It's hot, it's dirty. It's hot, it's dirty. There's not much that's really glamorous about it. Which brings us to Morgan and how he toughed it out for 11 years, working his way from general laborer to crew leader to manager. There were six other guys that I hired in with. None of them work here to this day. It was the challenge and the learning. I don't like to be going through the motions. I like the challenge, uh, the change and the challenge. First day of the job, I was like a kid at a candy store. My eyes were wide open. I was just overwhelmed with 
what was going on. I couldn't believe it. Like like you were this morning with, wow, look at all the stuff you guys have. We broke all the pieces. So one guy doesn't call, doesn't show up. One of the toughest things about his job is not the grit or the glitches, it's people. Not everyone sees the beauty in the work as Morgan does. And instead of being manager, James says he needs to be counselor. I try not to know everything that they have going on in their life, but if something's off, hey, you okay? What, 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 what do we need to do? You know, do we need to talk about something? Figure out, get you some time off so you can be out of here, so you can get things right, that kind of stuff. Morgan recognized that work and home complement one another, that for success, and meaning the two have to be in balance. I think some guys it's super easy for them to do and then other guys they bring home in just because they don't know when to stop with it. Just like a lot of guys like myself bring work home because it never turns off. And it's one of the hardest things to turn off is the transition between personal and work and work and home. Turnover in a tight labor market in a tough, gritty work environment is a challenge facing businesses all the time. For Morgan, it's more than just excelling in managing people, or pay raises, for that matter, from the promotions. It's cultivating an internal sense of purpose. What we made is going to be there for another 100 years, you know. Um, to be able to say that I did that. It might have been a little part, we still did that. That's what drives me to get up out of bed every day, is how are we going to impact the world? What are we building today that someone in the future is going to see? Many experts predict that in coming years, as many as half of all jobs could be replaced by robots and artificial intelligence, leading to widespread technological unemployment. Join us at the Acton Institute on October 25 for a lecture series event to hear Jay Richards argue that these claims are based on bad philosophy, not on solid evidence. Moreover, they ignore basic lessons of both history and economics. There is disruption coming, which means that we will need to prepare for work in the age of smart machines. Register at actin.org slash events. After running an abortion clinic in Philadelphia for over 30 years, Kermit Gosnell's facility was first raided in a narcotics investigation in 2010, where FBI and police found something much worse. Evidence that Gosnell had been performing illegal, late-term abortions for years in a filthy and horrendous environment. Gosnell hired girls without any medical training to perform abortions and administer anesthesiology to his patients, treating both the mothers and their children with inhumane disrespect. About two weeks ago, a film about the events and the trials surrounding Kermit Gosnell was released, which has received praise from viewers despite the odds. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Phelan McAleer, who's the co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Untold Story of America's Most Prolific Serial Killer, and the producer of the recently released film, Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. Phelan, thank you for joining me on the show. Well, thank you for having me on. I was recently having dinner with my sister when I mentioned to her that I was seeing the movie Gosnell and that I was looking forward to speaking with you on the phone for the podcast. And she did not know who Kermit Gosnell was, unfortunately, which I actually think is not uncommon. So can you explain for us what is this movie all about? What are the events that it focuses on? Yeah, I mean, you're just, it's not unusual, in fact, until, you know, recently we would occasionally meet pro-life people who'd never heard of Kermit Gosnell. I think that just shows you the power of the, of the mainstream media to keep a story that should be on the front page to keep it suppressed. So Kermit Gosnell is America's biggest serial killer. He's an abortion doctor from Philadelphia who's now serving three life sentences in Huntington Prison, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he, he killed women. He killed babies born alive. Um, and he did it often, and he did it hundreds, if not thousands of times in a 30-year career uh, of killing. And uh, he was allowed to do it by a political class, a political establishment that that wants to protect abortion rights, you know, and uh, 
the, it, it was all started through the, what really allowed him to go into killing full time and untrammeled and un, unsupervised was a, a pro choice Republican governor who uh, who said we're not going to inspect abortion clinics every year, even though the law says that. So he was allowed to kill. He's a killer. He's he's serving life sentences now in prison. Um, and his trial was a shocking trial, but the, one of the most shocking aspects of it was how it was almost not covered by the mainstream media until they were shamed into it by a massive social media campaign. So it's a great story about media cover-ups, political cover-ups, corruption, violence against women, violence against minorities, most of his victims were minorities. But it also is a great story about media bias. So that's why we wrote the book and made the movie. And you sat in on the trial, correct? Yes, yes. I happened to be in Philadelphia for another, um, for another, for my previous documentary, Frack Nation, which is, you know, fracking speak in Pennsylvania. And, you know, on my day off, because I'm a journalist, I thought, oh, I'll go down and see what's on. And I looked at the local paper, see what interesting court cases are on. Because I like wandering around court cases in my time off. And there uh, I walked in and I saw amazing uh, uh, photographs of evidence. I saw, I heard unbelievable testimony. Kermit Gosnell was sitting a few feet away from me, but the most shocking thing of all uh, was sitting behind me was the row after row after row of empty press benches. But this story, I've ca- I've been a journalist for 25 years. I'd never heard such evidence. I'd never heard such a story. It's an amazing story. Even, you know, even as a, you know, I know it's, hor- you know, it's horrific, but it's an amazing story that that any journalist should love to cover and uh i i i was shocked that no one was covering it so i went back to california and said to my wife this is the story we're covering now we're going to do this and she said no no we don't do abortion so i ordered the transcripts and got her to read them and then she came to me a few days later and said this is the story we're doing now so when you opened up the newspaper that day and you saw the court case going on that's when you first heard of Gosnell. It wasn't before. It wasn't in the news at all. When the story broke, it was during the trial. Yeah, I may have seen something on some blog somewhere about it, uh, but uh, very little. Uh, you know, it's hard to remember now. It wasn't a complete shock. I think when I saw it in the paper, but I, oh, I remember thinking, oh, that guy. I remember reading something about that guy. I must go down and have a look. And then you walk in and you hear this evidence uh, of of this serial killer who was allowed to kill and play inside. I mean. And, and he was only caught by luck, uh, by luck and a hero cop. So he, he, he was also selling opioid drugs on the side um, to supplement his, his vast income. And it was a drugs investigation. It was a drugs cop who, who started investigating the drugs and found out that people had been killed there, but there was no police report. And he thought this was very odd, odd and decided to investigate further. You know that saying, if it bleeds, it leads. And yet we find yeah. in this case that it didn't, which just goes to show that the media really, really completely blacked out the story. Yeah, look, no matter what way you, you, you cut this one, this isn't a massive news story. This should have been a massive news story. I mean, even take the liberal talking points. I mean, the woman he was convicted of killing, she was a, a refugee. She'd spent 20 years in a refugee camp, a person of color, a refugee. She came to Philadelphia, a sanctuary city. Well, she received no sanctuary there. She was dead. She was in America four months. She died in Kermit Gosnell's clinic. She's a classic victim. The other woman he killed was an African-American. This is a man who had, a black man, an African-American man, who had nicer rooms for white women and worse rooms for black women. I mean, every liberal talking point was covered here. But they, did, but in in the league table of, of of news stories, you know, refugees and, and black people and people of color get knocked right down because abortion must be protected on all, at all costs. So, do you believe that the reason that it's been so blacked out by the media, the trial, and even the movie, which we're going to get into later, do you think that at its root, that's because the human rights issue has been so politicized? That the human rights issue, you know, revolving around Kermit Gosnell, that it just became about abortion. Yeah, it's, it, people people can be sacrificed for for abortion in in the in the leftist worldview. The, abortion is more important than people. Uh, the right to an abortion, and that's why they're protecting. That's why they're not covering this because this asks really awkward, difficult questions about abortion. Questions that can't really be answered. It shines a negative spotlight on abortion, and they don't want that. 
This story, both when it hit the news and even now as it's hitting theaters, it's faced barriers in the media, as we've talked about. Um, only 600 theaters were showing the film during the first week in its release, which is about two weeks ago now. Compared to, say, Avengers, is released in, on average, about 4,000 theaters. So now in its second week, 200 theaters have pulled the film, and we know that these are the theaters at which the highest numbers of attendance are coming in for this movie, Gosnell. According to John Sullivan, who is um, the film's marketing director, who also served as the producer, he says the drop cannot be written off as a mere coincidence or business as usual. He told the Daily Wire that, quote, I can tell you from my experience in 15 years of releasing movies independently, we're in uncharted territories. He says it's an impacted fall, no doubt about it. But the fact that we've dropped from theaters where the movie is the number six or number nine movie is just something you don't see. Yeah, I mean... We we were, we were in 600 theaters, but we were num we, we were in the number 10 top movies of the opening weekend. We were the most uh, the, the biggest independent movie of the whole weekend. I mean, the only movies that beat us were, were number five movie uh, per screen average. The biggest independent movie. The only ones ahead of us were, were studio backed, and we were in 671 movies. And what does what do these theaters do? What do they do? The, the next weekend, they drop 200 theaters. Like, it's unbelievable. And it's not like they drop the lower performing ones. They actually seem to make a point of dropping the higher performing ones. You know, but this is part of a pattern. We're used to this now. Facebook have blocked their ads. NPR wouldn't let us advertise. Uh, when we try to raise the money, we raised the money for this through, kick, through crowdfunding. When we try to go on Kickstarter, they wouldn't let us uh, raise money on their platform. We had, you know, because... Uh, we, we couldn't call Kermit Gosnell a murderer. And I was going, he was convicted of murder, you know? And so this is the kind of um, opposition this film has, has faced. I mean, it's just like when, when the trial was going on, the mainstream media wouldn't cover it until they were shamed into it. This is the trial. That ho this is the film that Hollywood doesn't want you to see. This is the film that, that the mainstream media doesn't want you to see. And the book also, we raised, we sold enough books when it was first launched to be number four in the New York Times bestseller list. They didn't put us in at all. Uh, they they said, oh, no, it's an editorial decision. I'm going, you mean the New York Times bestseller list isn't based on numbers? You know, so the New York Times bestseller list is a fake news item in a fake newspaper run by fake journalists. And, you know, that's the, that's, that's the truth. And, and they use that influence, that power, when it comes to covering stuff up. So I'm wondering, through your production work and then having witnessed the trial as a journalist, did you get to speak with any of Gosnell's past patients? Yes, yes, we did, yes. I'm wondering, what were their stories, or what did they tell you? Well, you know, um, he, I mean, he, 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 was a, he, was all, he was all about money, he was all about power. People who wanted to reverse procedures, he wouldn't reverse them, you know, which is a very weird thing to do. Uh, not, you know, they, they, if they wanted to change their mind, he would sometimes tell them, "Oh, I've already g given you a drug that uh, that'll start the procedure; it can't be reversed." That's completely inaccurate. But he he was obsessed with, with abortion, doing abortions, even when the people had changed their minds. Um, so he he treat, yeah, as I say, he treated black women; they got they got dirty, filthy rooms. White women got clean rooms. And then there were women who'd been there some four or five times for abortions. One woman had nine abortions at his clinic. So it's a mixed bag of, of, of interesting people uh, and interesting life stories. Yeah. After I watched the movie about a week ago now, while the credits were rolling, the viewers saw live footage from the real raid that took place at both Gosnell's clinic and his home. And they also saw real photos. And it was pretty, um, there was just a, a lull in the room as these were being shown during the credits. And even after the credits rolled, there were still a few people in the theater who just, I think they were stunned just sitting there in their seats. So I'm sure you've gotten a lot of um, feedback about this movie, a lot of people being exposed to a huge trial, a huge story that they did not know existed before. What's the most rewarding part about your contribution in helping bring this story to the forefront? Well, I mean, if you, if you look at Twitter, everyone says they've never experienced it before. Everyone sits on to the, to the credits. When the credits end, everyone just keeps sitting there uh, in, in quiet shocks. Some people 
pastor told me that people have got up and started praying and everyone's joined in. But other people have just then continued the conversation outside. Some people have sat in their car for 15 minutes. Some people have said they brought their children and had these enormously interesting conversations on the way home. Um, so it's 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 all rewarding. It's all rewarding. I mean, we we you know we just wanted to bring the truth uh, to people, and I think people watch the movie and are shocked. And then when at the end when they see the pictures and realize that the crazy things they saw were were, were true, they weren't added in to spice up the story. That's a real shocker. All right, Phelan, well, thank you so much for speaking with me today, and I look forward to seeing more of the effect that this movie will have. Yeah. Well, I mean, we just we just got a tweet last night from someone who said they went in pro-choice and now they're pro-life. And, you know, we, we went there, we made this movie to bring the truth to people, and we're glad. And we showed it to a liberal friend also, and he left the room, went outside, started chain-smoking and said... I have to rethink everything. I have to rethink everything. And really, as filmmakers, that's what a journalist, that's what we want to do, is to make people rethink everything. Uh, and they can come up to their own conclusions. Well, thank you so much, Fellam. Thank you very much for joining the podcast. And I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for listening today. If you want to reach the podcast team here at Acton, email us at rfa at acton.org or leave us a message at 888-705-4180. To learn more about the Acton Institute and to see a full calendar of upcoming events, visit our website at acton.org. Lastly, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to give us a rating on iTunes. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Nathan Moore. 